squirm plus one. By, by the way, Mr. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to call the Public Works Board meeting here to order November 11th, 2014. Uh, Misty, would you please call the roll? Mr. Fritch? Here. Mr. Scharr? Mr. Pickard? Here. Mr. Reich? Here. Mr. Temperley? Here. Mrs. Wolf? Here. Next is correction and or approval of the minutes from last month, October 14th. I'd move to approve. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Moving on to item four, questions and public comment, and seeing none, we'll move right into item five, discussion recommendation on sewer user discharging permits. And we have a memo, thorough memo from Strand. You want to go through it? Well, I, I, Mark, if it's okay, I don't think we'll go through the whole thing, but yeah. we do have with us the authors of the memo, Kevin Hopkins and, and Troy Larson. Uh, they've helped us a lot with this whole plant upset thing. And so if it's all right with you, Mark, what I'd like to do is just maybe have them kind of recap yes. where we're at uh, with kind of a discussion starter with the understanding that uh, this discussion tonight really should probably be about next steps. And I think you'll find as they go through their presentation that we've probably done as much as we can in the plant. And so now we're looking at what we need to do outside of the plant. Yep, so understood. if that's all right, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Very good. Thanks. Kevin Hopkins from Strand. Um, just to give you some background. I haven't been to a public works meeting in a while with the city, but I've been at Strand for 25 years. Um, been doing work for the city for about 15 of those years. So um, Troy Larson is one of our, we've got a couple of licensed operators on staff and Troy's uh, our lead operator, if you will. and. Uh, he's been doing a lot of legwork and, and helping out on this project. So um, just to give you a little summary of, of what's happened, um, in January this year, the plant effluent started going downhill, and they, um, it was shortly after that they, they started to exceed the discharge permit limits at the DNR. Uh, requires them the plant to meet and we were asked to help troubleshoot see what was going on at the plant and one of the first things was Troy went and looked at the operating parameters of the facility to make sure they are within um, normal operating range or reasonable operating range and and didn't find anything that unusual um, some suggestions were made to tweak a few parameters here and there, but they didn't really result in any improved um, effluent quality. Um, with the cold weather that we had this winter, you know, everybody experienced that. It, it does stress a, a treatment plan out, but not to the degree that we saw this, this past winter. So after the review of the, the, the um, operating parameters, um, uh, Bill Kiesling had uh, purchased some some bio they're called bio augmentation uh, additives um, and he's used them in the past when he's had process upsets with some success uh, tried a, a couple of those products on the plant didn't really improve uh, quality um, another thing that was done was uh, to visit uh, we visited 25 or mostly the city visited 25 facilities in the city that discharged to the treatment plant including the the DOT rest stop and uh, the idea there was to um, get an idea of what these facilities were discharging is there any chemicals that they're using um, any processes that would impact the treatment plant um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second uh, the other thing that we that was done was to add a full-time pH meter uh, or permanent pH meter in the influent structure of the treatment plant. In the past, they would just take grab samples, run a sample up to the lab, measure the pH. With the full-time permanent pH meter, um, you've got data running full-time, 24 hours, um, 
and you can see when there's spikes or dips in the pH. Typically, we want wastewater is going to be around neutral, give or take. Um, <clears throat> and we just wanted to have an idea, better idea of what's happening in that regard as far as what the pH was coming into the, into the plant of the wastewater. Um, the other thing that was started uh, this summer and is still ongoing is the cleaning of the oxidation ditches. The idea was that um, if we've got a lot of grit material building up in the oxidation ditches, that's taken away volume, uh, treatment volume. Um, so we wanted to clean those out just to try to improve things. So with the industrial and commercial uh, site investigations, Basically, we went to the facilities, interviewed key staff, again, seen, looked to see what, um, what their operations were. And in many cases, uh, they would discharge little or no wastewater to the, to the sewer system. Um, so those are kind of checked off the list and we moved on. Um, there's four, three or four that, that kind of stood out. Um, and those included uh, Crystal Farms, uh, Tyranina Brewery, um, Oscree, and Hamlin. At Crystal Farms, the things that we found both during the uh, site visits and afterwards when the city started doing sampling of their wastewater was uh, they had a high BOD or biochemical oxygen demand, high strength wastewater going into the system. Um, they're relatively, they're very close to the treatment plant. They can't get much closer than where they're at right now. So anything they're discharging to the sewers is going to come to the plant fairly quickly without a whole lot of dilution. Um, is that good or bad? The dilution? Yeah. Um, it can help in many cases, um, but th there's just no, there, there's not, much travel time between the once they discharge and once it so gets into the plant. Is, what, what's the volume of fluid in the oxidation ditch versus uh, typical uh, influent in a day or in an hour? Uh, what's the turnover rate of the ditch? What, whatever kind of statistic you can to give me an idea of. Um, it's, yeah. it's about 24 hours, give or take. So there's about 24 hours detention time in, in the ditch. Okay. <clears throat> um, and, you know, typically these oxidation ditches are very robust. I mean, they've, they've served the city well in the yeah. last 20-plus years. Um, and, th and that was, I guess, one thing that, that struck Bill in particular and us when we, were, when we got involved is that he had just, you know, typically had such good effluent quality out of the plant. And things just really started sliding this past January. Um, so the, the, the other thing at the Crystal Farms, um, the, we noticed pH swings in their, in their wastewater, high BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. Um, the, the plant has seen chunks of cheese coming into the plant and collecting on the, the bar screen. That's kind of the first line of defense at the plant. It's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It collects solids and, and those get deposited in a dumpster. But you don't, usually don't want to see chunks of cheese coming into your treatment plant because that means there's, there's fat associated with that and it makes it it's more difficult to, to treat. Um, the other thing was, uh, one thing that we noticed when we were on site was they used quaternary means chemical, cleaning chemicals that contain quaternary amines. And, you know, the, the good news is that quaternary amines are very effective biocides and a lot of uh, food processors use it. The bad news is that it's an effective biocide and it's very harmful to treatment plants. We've got a biological system at the treatment plant and um, these quaternary amines can be very detrimental and in some cases they, they'll kill off a plant um, and you know a plant will have to bring in new new bio, new seed to, to start up the plant and we've seen that happen before so so this quaternary amines how long have they been 
it, I'm sure it's been a ramp up in, in terms of use in the industry in the in, the, in cleaning. Is it been in over the last five years or 15 years? Do you know? Do you have any idea what the prevalence rate is, increase rate? Um, I, probably five to ten, but. Troy, I don't know if you can. Well, anecdotally, I, we couldn't we couldn't yeah. give a statistic on it, but yeah, what's happened is they're they're what's uh, they bioaccumulate they bioaccumulate. They're a little more pervasive. So what uh, the advantage of them is is that if you like pour it on the floor and, and at doorways, it will have potency for much longer than say a chlorine. A chlorine would kind of spend itself, it would wear itself out and become inerted. And these quaternary amines are favorable to the industries because they have that staying power. So there has been a trend towards them at the detriment of wastewater treatment. Yep. Thank you. So those are the things that we saw and and at the at the plant and discovered after the sampling was at, at Crystal Farms after the sampling was performed. Um, uh, the brewery was somewhat similar. Um, we saw a big, we saw large pH swings, both uh, going acidic and caustic, you know, below and above seven on the pH scale. Um, fairly high BOD and phosphorus concentrations in their effluent. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with the additional loading from these facilities, and, and they haven't been sampled regularly until recently, so they may have been discharging at those higher BOD and phosphorus rates for some time. We're not entirely sure of that, um, but, you know, we, we don't have a, a true smoking gun, if you will, as far as what's going on with the plant. We've got a lot of evidence of, you know, high BOD, quaternary means, things like that, that have had, likely had a negative impact on the plant. Um, the, the other industry was Oscree, and um, we were concerned about them we wanted to find out more about them because it's a food industry and you know they they could be um, discharging high BOD but frankly we don't know that because uh, haven't had a been able to find a good sampling location um, to, to get some decent sampling results from them or any sampling results and uh, the, the last industry that that was kind of on our radar was Hamlin and um, th they were on there primarily because they, we were seeing pH swings from them. Um, I believe that's come, gotten under control since uh, you know Bill has been working with the Hamlin uh, folks, and they seem to have that better under better control than it was just a couple of a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Um, so those are the four. There, there may be other industries that you know need to be investigated further, but um, those are kind of on our radar. Um, and I guess to maybe summarize where we're at, and uh, some of our recommendations included, um, you know, continue cleaning the oxidation ditch, and that's being done right now. Um, enforce the uh, the ordinance, uh, in particular the the pH limits the pH the ordinance requires pH to be between six and nine anything below six it gets really acidic anything above nine gets very caustic both those those upper and lower ranges uh, can have a, a harsh effect on the on the treatment process um, and bill has been you know contacting a, a couple of industries Hamlin included Crystal Farms, um, you know, with some some res positive results, particularly with Hamlin, uh, but I don't think that Crystal Farms discharges have gotten completely under control, um, and, and that's a work in progress at this point. Um, the other thing that your sewer use ordinance allows is uh, pretreatment, um, and that could be, you know, holding. Uh, the high strength wastewater a little bit longer in a detention basin and trickling it out over a longer p 
period of time rather than just slug loading the plant and dumping it all in the sewer. Um, it could mean, you know, if they have a high strength waste, maybe they got to haul it off site for land treatment or treatment somewhere else besides at the city's uh, treatment plant. Um, anything that would, you know, maybe potentially help relieve the, the load and the stress on the wastewater plant. Um, another thing is the continue working with Crystal Farms to maybe minimize their use of quaternary means. I don't think they would necessarily give up the use of it because again it's a it's a potent biocide but you know maybe there's some things that can be done at the treatment at their plant to minimize the discharge to the sanitary sewer. Um, continue sampling these facilities and, and others. Um, the city has the, the authority uh, to assess sewer user charges um, for high strength waste. That may be one means of offsetting some of the additional costs that you're accruing for handling, taking care of this problem at the treatment plant. Um, the city also, the sewer use ordinance has the ability to um, issue discharge permits and you have issued some in the past. Uh, the DOT rest stop is permitted. Um, Hamlin is, uh, the brewery is, although their permit has expired, but it's still in place. Uh, but some of these other facilities have not been permitted. And the, the reason we would want to permit them is it gives you a little bit more control as far as what they're discharging. You have a better idea what they're discharging, a uh, better idea of their operations. Um, and along with that, um, the, the, the city can also require sampling and metering manholes. In order to get uh, good sampling results, the proper sampling results, you really need a good metering manhole that measures the flow and uh, have an automatic sampler that collects samples. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a summary. Anyone have any questions? Well, I have some. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of charts in this report, and it looked like they ended around August. So I was wondering that what the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, judging, judging, judging from the scale, it looked like the data ended around August, and we're in November, so I was wondering if we had any information about September, October, as how the plant was running, how the effluent was doing. Yeah, um, I think there was, in September, there may have been a, a violation. Um, anecdotally, I, I spoke with Bill a few days ago, and he said that he's seeing uh, the effluent quality kind of go down, which means uh, the concentrations are going up a little bit. Um, we ended this at the chart in August because that's what we had at the time, but um, I think he's starting to see things backslide a little bit. So. Yeah, because there's, you know, looking here, well, on both, but well, on the second, on the on the TSS, it's you know there's a huge spike and then it settles down a bit. This has a lot of scatter in there yet, even all the way to the end. Yeah, and the you know the key here is uh, you know you, you need to meet the the winter and the summer limits. Uh, winter the winter limits are in place right now, um, so they get he gets a little bit of a reprieve. Um, the, the downside of that is it, it gets a little bit harder to, to treat in the winter time. Um, so. One comment I'd make quick, Mark, is that in talking to Bill, I, I think what's what's happening to a certain extent is because we're being more vigilant, we're getting a little more uh, communication and cooperation from these four, at least uh, three out of the four right now. So as Kevin said, there is, you know, it's still not great. There's a little backsliding every once in a while, but because he's been in contact, you know, almost on a weekly basis with some of these folks, uh, you know, we've seen some 
improvement, but it's more of, uh, you know, we're able to kind of get a warning that something's coming as opposed to we've got the plant set up and able to handle what's going on right now. Yeah. I hear Rich's, I, I, I understand what you're getting at. <laughs> um, uh, and up, up the oxidation ditch cleaning, what's the status of that? One is done. And now we're just kind of waiting on the weather. And actually, this kind of weather isn't bad, really, for this. Um, so we're hoping now to get that done, actually, before the snow flies and it freezes and all that sort of thing. Unfortunately, uh, just talking to Bill the other day, or yesterday, I guess it was, we're already starting to see the foaming on the top of the oxidation ditch that we saw last year, which is a sign that it's not quite functioning properly, if I understand all the chemistry. That was kind of a real red flag when it starts to foam, and the, the one that is in service right now is starting to foam. So, uh, so the, one, the one that was cleaned... Is the one that's in service, it's starting to foam? Not quite. The, the one that was cleaned is not quite back in service yet, so we're, we're still operating on the existing one. And our hope is to get the original one, number one, if you will, going again, and then get two cleaned ASAP. And then we'll also have some data to say, say did this cleaning do any good comparing, yes. comparing the two? Correct. Yeah, and it, it's the, the ditch cleaning was kind of on Bill's radar for a while anyways. It was on his to-do list, and yeah. with the upset, I think that took away from his time. And, you know, it's been a it's been a uh, constant project, if you will, for him. So, But the, he, he knew he had to clean the ditches sooner than later. Can I ask, how deep is the layer of grit in the oxidation ditch? Are we talking inches, feet? Um, I have not seen pictures uh, the last time it was clean which was 10 years ago maybe 12 12 years ago I mean there would be piles it it varies it wasn't just a uniform covering but there would be you know a couple of feet of written spots so in other words the volume <coughs> the reduction that it causes is somewhat significant then yeah there's a couple things with it uh, not only the volume that's consumed but Think of this oxidation ditch as a river that just keeps replenishing itself. What, where it deposits its solids first is in the corners, and then that changes the velocity. So you start having this, these airs, areas that are impacted, and you start having some solids. You know, This is a, supposed to be a controlled aerobic environment. You start having environments that are no longer controlled, they're no longer aerobic, and you start seeing some fringe biology going, and that... that is just out of your control, so therefore it's it's not a good thing because these plants are intended to be under their control. Normally, how long before we clean out the oxidation ditches? Should it be several, 10 years, less? Well, I mean, if, yeah, again, I'm not sure what he's got what he's found in the first ditch as far as material. Um, uh, 10 years is, I wouldn't go in much longer than that if you can. But it is very time consuming. Um, he's got half his plant out of service while he's, while he's doing it. So there's, and with the upset, there was some hesitation on Bill's part. I think he would agree with that, that he just didn't want to lose that volume that he did have. And, uh, but, um, you know, it's something that had to be done sooner than later. Any other questions, comments? Where, where are we recommending, or where are you recommending they install more metering facilities? Well, um, Crystal Farms would be one. Uh, are, you, are you talking about in which facilities? Yeah. Crystal Farms would be one. Um, Oscar would be another one. Um, um, the brewery. I mean, we we know that there the two of the, two of those three are are discharging high concentration waste. Um, uh, Oscar's a little bit 
we do, we don't know what's coming from Osprey. Um, and I think it, you know it needs to be. There may be a, a, another industry or two that we just haven't pinpointed yet um, that may also require or should have a sampling manhole. It, it says in here that that cost is the responsibility of the discharger. Are we going to enforce that? That's the big question. Um, there's some hesitancy to do that. It's an expensive thing for the uh, for the company to do. Obviously, it's a very important thing. And not only does it give us uh, the information we need to know what's going on, but it, it again is that that warning system, so we we know something's coming. So that is you know, the hesitation has been quite honestly that it's an expensive thing for a company to do, and it, should it really be the the financial responsibility of the company to do this, or are there other options? And and so I guess it's a question of uh, political will, almost, if I may, to to enforce this. The ordinance actually is quite clear, though. So it would require an ordinance change for us to shift the burden from the from the company to the taxpayers or the ratepayers. So right now, that it doesn't appear to be optional. It's in the ordinance and that we don't have the ability to just turn our backs on what the ordinance says. We have a ballpark of like how much money? I, I think we said something between eight and 10,000 at, at one time. Am I in the ballpark there? Yeah. Um, it may be, that's probably on the low end, uh, I think. It's probably more in the 10 to 15 range. That's for the cost of the metering at each facility? Yeah, that, that would include uh, basically a, a manhole structure with a, a metering device in it. Typically, it's a flume, um, open channel type flume, uh, electronics to measure the depth, which converts that to flow, um, uh, probably a sampling hut, and then an automatic sampler. So there's there's a fair amount of expenditure involved and in effort. If, if I could, Mark, just to, you know, kind of maybe keep the discussion going here. Kevin's mentioned a number of things, permitting, pretreatment, uh, monitoring manhole, uh, and surcharges, I think, are the big four right now. And I wonder if, uh, as, as Vicki says, they're all in the ordinance. They're all things that we should be required to do or the customer should be required to do. I wonder if, if it would be worth it to just kind of talk about them in steps and that would, you know, number one would be permitting and that we we really step our enforcement up of permitting that begins to at least start getting some information here about what is actually going on. Uh, it's something obviously we can do, well not maybe, maybe it's not so obvious, but it's something we can do across the board, uh, not just single out certain places, but really step up our permitting and, and gathering information that way. So you feel more comfortable in doing the permitting first then see what happens and come back to us again on uh, bumping up, like monitoring. Yeah, I, uh, yes, I, that's what I'm saying. Yes, we yeah. would feel more comfortable making that a first step. And <laughs> Guess I'll break it before the night's over. Um, actually, the way that it works is somebody fills out a permit application, and in part of that application, they say what they're discharging and what their operation is. Then the city engineer, which would be either of these two gentlemen, would look at that information and then see if they need to go further in terms of do we need to start monitoring specific things. Uh, so 
the logical first step would be to get everybody under a permit that should be under a permit and then go from there. Uh, we have done requirements of monitoring manholes in the past and uh, and it, we usually don't resort to that until we've pinpointed a problem of a specific nature that is causing a bad outcome at our treatment plant because the city is under a permit from the DNR and if we don't make the people who discharge to our facility fall into their requirements the big stick of the DNR is going to come down on us so it's not just that we want to make sure all the bugs stay alive and everything runs the way it should it's 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 a rippling effect and so if we have to live with the rules of the DNR we sort of have to pass on what those rules are to the customers who could upset our plant and then put us in non-compliance so it's not like it's everybody just wants to go out and do that just because we can it's we're being kind of forced into it That, that's a good point because we are coming up to our permitting time I believe next next March we're on the hook so. so so the first step of permitting is permit application where the the customer tells you what they're doing um, are, haven't you informally already done that I'd say yes on, on the majority of them so I, I would hope that we'd have an access an easier access to folks and let them know now we're gonna we're gonna actually have you put that down on paper yeah it's it's been a trend for the DNR in recent years to somewhat uh, kind of review your last five years these permits last five years and if there are any violations on the books they ask you how they've been resolved and because this is ongoing it would not be at all surprising to me for DNR to kind of audit the circumstance at that point they've been sending letters as months have been violated they're they're completely in the loop but they might expect it, it might come to a head and there, there might be some resolution expected in the permitting process And un until we see exactly what everyone is dealing with, it wouldn't really be fruitful for this body to say, well, we want you to do one kind of enforcement of your sewer user ordinance um, instead of another because each, search, each situation is going to be different. Some people, it might make complete sense for them to do a uh, somewhat limited pretreatment other people it might be that um, like um, I think it was Kevin said that they may have to treat off-site um, but until you know what their effluent is and exactly what their operation is you can't make those decisions and monitoring manholes also it, it's not necessarily one size fits all it's the individual effluent uh, to drive that decision what industries are currently required to be permitted? Um, well, there's the, the current permits are for the brewery, um, the DOT rest stop, Hamlin. Um, I think the the rest stop or the commercial rest stop across the highway um, oasis and there may be another one that I'm not thinking of at the moment but we don't as just as a rule require all say any food processing or it, you know, generically require a permit for a certain type of industry I, I don't think our ordinance is that specific is it Vicki or is it no, it doesn't single out individual types of operations for a permit. It just says that commercial or industrial users can come under a permit. And like I said, I think the most fair thing is to start the permitting process with all of those types of users and then weed through until you get to situations where you're going to require pretreatment or you're going to require uh, at, at the <coughs> minimum a monitoring manhole 
Um, or you might look at their effluent and say, well, there's no problem here. There's nothing that can be done. And I think that Bill and Paul started that process this summer with going to various different customers, such as what was on the list, just to informally talk to them about what their operations were to try to get a handle on where these upsets were coming from. And so it's just a continuation of that process. Yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, not every industry on, or facility on the list is, needs to be permitted. I mean, it, it may be a quarter of these on the list. You know, it's something that needs to be fleshed out, but certainly not all of them. The ordinance says just uh, has the right to require a discharge permit from commercial or industrial users of the sewer. So I, I agree we should probably start with kind of a broad brush and work our way uh, down to where we think the issues are. So what exactly are you looking from us? Uh, a resolution to that effect or what? I, yeah, I guess as much as anything, just some uh, support and backing that we're going the right way and that we should be enforcing this. I don't know that it requires, a, you know, an official resolution or motion or anything. I'm not even, I'm not sure about that. But uh, as much as anything, we wanted you to know about the issue and that we are going to be doing this or we're going to need to be doing this and we want to make sure the council's informed about that. So uh, I guess I'll leave that one kind of to you, Vicki, if we need an official motion or resolution or anything. I don't believe that we need that because their ordinances already tell us what to do. Um, I think kind more of for... Consensus from us? Yeah, um, I think that most of the value in having this discussion is just to make the Public Works Board aware of it and um, and like Paul said, eventually the council, as well as the public, as that filters through and people watching, that, yeah, we do have to start stepping up our enforcement. That doesn't mean everybody gets a, a ticket or a, a citation or anything. It just might mean that we have to be a little bit more mindful of who the customers are and what is it they're doing. One way that we've enforced in the past and with a certain amount of success has been the grease traps in all of our food service type industries, uh, like restaurants, that sort of thing. So it's not like we haven't done anything in terms of trying to control what goes into our wastewater treatment plant. Um, and um, that has been met with a certain amount of success. And um, so as we continue to look at what other kinds of discharges we have, um, there's a whole range of options available. On the, uh, I think Kevin mentioned tonight about the, the stronger strengths of the discharges. We do have the ability to, to issue a surcharge, and that's in our rates already. Um, if, but we can't do that if we don't know what is being discharged, and that's kind of where the monitoring manhole would come into play. I guess from my perspective, I guess so that we're in compliance with our permit with the DNR that the staff take and be vigilant and you know, work with uh, our commercial and industrial base as to try and, you know, like it sounds like you guys are doing, to take and make sure we're in compliance so we don't get in, into trouble. And um, um, I lost what I was going to say. Well, it sounds like the wastewater treatment facility and operation has everything you, you guys really need, all the tools you need. But you just may not be, and this is not a criticism, you're just not... Uh, not executing to the extent of that, that the ordinances allow, but you you would be able to if you found something wrong. It's some, you know, I, I heard the gentleman say that we've got no smoking gun here. Uh, there's no clear source of what's what's been the driving factor for these overages that we've had. Um, although it does look like, I, I'm not telling you guys how to do your jobs, but. Uh, it looks like there was big change about a year ago, right? I mean, uh, what was the steady, it was all steady state before then and then all of a sudden a big change. So I'm not sure what kind of new factor might have come into play that 
and, and I, I don't know if you've you've thought of that at all that that was a big part of the conversations with each industry that window of time where the change occurred uh, was asked of everyone and uh, there was nothing divulged anyhow that was no that intriguing from that no there, yeah there wasn't uh, there was one interesting bit where one of the one of the industries had a one or two month shutdown that preceded that and they came back into service uh, but that was I don't know, Kevin, if Paul, if there were any other things that lined up with that timeline, and that was Oscar, and we do not have the sampling with them, which is a little frustrating because their their manholes just don't really lend themselves to being able to get a sampler in them. So there's no data to follow. So Oscar does not have a wastewater discharge permit. Correct. Correct. And is that is it voluntary for them? Well, it's it's the city's decision as to who requires a permit. So how are we requiring it now? How are you determining who? who? But we're just not doing it. We haven't followed through with well, it. Just so, so the, the, you know, there are half a dozen uh, customers with, that ha have permits right now. It's and it's the city's decision as to who needs to have a permit. Now, particularly with Oscree, it sounds like you have very little information from them so that's to me is a pretty obvious one to hit harder if if you use a carrot and a stick and the carrot doesn't work then that word that you guys have been using a bit called enforcement comes into play yeah yep you're right now I guess I'm, I'm unclear though why some companies it says like Hamlin has a discharge permit and keeps it up to date, Tyranina's expired. Why is that? Yeah, wh it, why is Tyranina's expired? Um, it, you can blame me for that one. I, I, it, 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 it's expired, but it doesn't, you know, it's, the expiration just means that we haven't sent out a new application to, to renew it and get that updated information. Um, is there get, a fee associated with it? Hundred dollars. So, I mean, permitting. There's, there's, there's a little. There's, there's overhead costs. There's paperwork to file, both on the customer side and on the city side. So, in terms of permitting, you don't want to go overboard on it either, right? Right. And I was just going to say that it's, it's some of the permitting that's happened over the last ten years or so. Um, was in reaction to something. For instance, the DOT rest stop, they asked to come in to the, to the city with their wastewater. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's how they got a permit. Um, Hamlin's permit, I think, was in place before I got involved. But, um, you know, the, the, the brewery, it's one of the first permits that I was involved with, um, with the city. So, and that was kind of a reaction to them growing them being in place and saying hey this is an industry that you know we should keep an eye on and it you know it hasn't been done across the board um but it hasn't been an issue either for that matter the plant's been running fine that's right you only you don't do extra work if you don't need to do it you only <laughs> <laughs> do what you need to do to to get the job done don't 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 over engineer, don't over, over process. So, in terms of permitting, yeah, some of these obviously, you know, Oscree, Crystal, maybe a few more, definitely. But we're, we're, how far down the list do you go? How do you decide that? As far as, and, and here, here's a question when you do. The first step is a permit application. So you ask the customer to fill out an application, right? Is there a kind of a higher likelihood because of the potential of law breaking that you're going to get more honest answers that way than the informal way? Um, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me back up a little bit. I guess we also have, we created a... Um, a short form, if you will, of, of, to 
give to different facilities to determine whether they need a permit, whether we think they should have a permit. I think we start there. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, folks are gonna be forthcoming, but um, you know, things change at a, tree, at a, at a uh, industrial facility or whatever the case, whatever the facility may be. They get new staff in, they get new different processes that use more wastewater or less wastewater. They use different chemicals. They don't necessarily even know what they're doing. Yeah, there is that, yeah. That is a part of these these meetings that we held already was an explanation of the treatment plant and the fact that, you know, a description of the fact that there was a biological process that could be interrupted yeah. and that there were settling processes that could be interrupted chemically. And, and oftentimes that is enough. There's There's often those folks can take that information, take away any stress that might be imposed on the treatment plant. And oftentimes you don't get to the smoking gun but you did indirectly, and, it t and the problem doesn't res return. Yeah. Well, I guess I'd say you do need to do what you need to do <laughs> and keep us informed as to what's happening. We don't want to stay out of the loop. Yeah, I agree with Doug. The rest of us were under the gun from the DNR, so... Um, if anybody in the Public Works Board or City Council disagrees with ordinances, they can give Vicki a call tomorrow and start the process to uh, lighten them up. But if none of us do, obviously we support these ordinances and we support staff to enforce them. I could, I'd like <clears throat> to suggest or commend the, your staff for their communication with DNR. They've been keeping a list of the efforts that they've been making, so it's it's obvious to DNR that you're not sitting on your hands. Uh, they're doing things, uh, w taking initiative like setting up the samplers to get the information they do have takes a lot of effort, and it's been easy to, to talk them into. If you give them an idea, that they want to get to the bottom of this so much that they're they're acting on it. We've more or less audited their lab. They've responded with any effort required to any of those questions. So there's real effort that can be demonstrated to the DNR, and oftentimes that's very important. Am, am I perceiving correctly here that the value of the permitting process is really discovery of what's going in, what each industry is potentially loading the system up with? Um, that's that's a large part of it and, then the, and the other you know if, if you do see a, an issue um, then we take that a little bit farther and, and use the ordinance language to you know have them put in a sampling manhole if it, if it comes to that so out of the 25 businesses that you've got on the back of your memo uh, that list of businesses could you do a like a priority ranking of what would be the most you know, suspect industries or companies that you might uh, you might ask for a permit. Well, we named uh, three: um, Tyranina, update their permit; <coughs> um, Crystal Farms, Oscree. Um, possibly Aztlin Engineering um, Cleaners. Yeah, not, yeah, that's a possibility. Um, what's what's harder on uh, a treatment plant? Biological stuff like from food processing, or chemicals from things like plating operations, or they doesn't matter. They're both. They can both be. Well, the 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 biological loading puts a stress on the plant, and. Um, you know, you can have trouble meeting limits uh, under those stressful conditions. Uh, a plating process, if if they've if they're discharging any metals, which you know they're all regulated, they're limited by what they can discharge. Um, or if there's other chemicals that that could have a you know pretty har harmful effect on the treatment process too. So. Um, any of them can have a deleterious effect on the plant. Okay. So, so Paul, did you, do you think you got what you wanted to get from the 
Public Works Board? I do. Yes, we've gotten some direction and some support, which we're looking for. So we will be kind of willowing that list down a little bit. And uh, I think in the back of our heads, we do have some pretty good ideas as to where we want to begin and what we want to do. So yes, thank the, you. I thought the report was very thorough. And I, a lot of work's been done over in the last year. <laughs> a lot of good work between city and Strand. And I'm, you know, I'm sure and it's good to hear that the uh, DNR is being kept up on that because that, that does help a lot I'm sure and good job everybody we'll get to the bottom of it and <laughs> stay in spec if nothing else then we'll move on to the next agenda item discussion on water leak detection this one is I, get, I think in a similar vein we wanted to uh, get you some information about what's going on here we don't have uh, a lot of analysis or data or anything ready to go but we wanted you to be aware of what we're doing and what we're finding and kind of our uh, initial first steps but I think as you know we've we've talked uh, in the last past few years I think past three years or so our water loss uh, rate has gone up quite a bit it had hovered around oh I don't know 12 to 19 percent for a while and then we bumped up to the 30 percent range and that is another thing that gets the DNR's attention as well as the Public Service Commission atten attention. So uh, we kind of took some some baby steps initially and we plugged some known leaks that we had or things that had finally started to surface and we had some issues at one of the reservoirs that we took care of. But it's very frustrating. We're still not seeing the decrease in the water loss that we had hoped we would see. So we, at the uh, strong encouragement of the DNR, did a leak detection study. And real quick, what that amounts to is we hire a contractor to basically go from fire hydrant to fire hydrant. And with a very sensitive listening device and a, a, a correlator, they can determine where there are leaks. And we knew that that would not be a real positive report. We weren't quite ready for 27 leaks, so that's, that's very high for a, a city or a system our size. And so part of what I want to do tonight is just make you aware that we have taken the first step in trying to find out what's going to our, what's, where our 30% is going now. We don't anticipate we'll ever be down to zero. That's just not going to happen. We're kind of shooting to get down to maybe 15 to 10%. But what we found in a study, which was a little concerning, as you see on the screen or you see in your packet, that of the 27 leaks, 16 of them were uh, fire hydrants. It's the hydrant itself that is leaking somewhere. And of those 16, the majority of them are in like the East Mills uh, Brewster Street area. And so we went out and took a look and found that every one of those hydrants is the same brand of hydrant put in about the same time. And so our first step is absolutely going to be to find out what's going on with those particular hydrants. Now, we've been in contact with a company by the name of Ferguson, and they've indicated they've had trouble with that particular make, model, and age hydrant in the past. And so they're going to come in and show us what we can do to check. Apparently, there's a couple of gaskets that either were not good to start off with or fail pretty quickly. So hopefully, uh, we can begin to take a quick <coughs> Uh, fix a uh, quick and in inexpensive fix to getting some of these hydrants taken care of and then start seeing what effect that has on our water loss the ones that are in the older part of town we're gonna have to do a little more investigation some of those might require total change out then things get a little more expensive hydrants are somewhere in a you know a thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range to change out and then we get to the next largest category which would be the main leaks and those get to be even more expensive to dig up a main and and uh, see what the cost or see what where the leak is we're probably looking in a range of four to five thousand dollars for every time we we dig up a broken main in that regard however we've been in contact with the dnr and there's a, a program uh, uh, that we weren't aware of before this because we didn't have to be i guess but uh, a loan program a very low interest loan program just for these types of things and so we're gathering more information on that uh, if we do intend to participate in that we have to have a, a, a intent to apply note to the dnr by the end of the year 
And so we're kind of gathering some information on dollars and timing and that sort of thing. And the way that loan program works is that we would apply at the end of this year and then money would be available in the end of the uh, state by NM budget. So we wouldn't really see money until 2016. But we can do it, we can actually, we can go fix the mains, you know, spend the money, get the loan and then pay off, use, use the loan money to pay off our costs. And if we have a tough enough situation where we get a lot of points is how they score these things, uh, we might be able to get a principal forgiveness on the loan, which means we could, we could actually do it fairly inexpensive. So I, I just wanted to make you aware that we're in the process of exploring a number of ways that we can take care of this water loss. And I do want to put it in context now, it's, it's somewhat difficult to put a dollar figure on what this loss is costing us. If it's purely water that is just being lost to the system or, or lost out of the system by leaks, that sort of thing, uh, at 30%, it's probably costing us somewhere around $10,000 a year. And we have to look at that with the understanding is that it's not money we could have had, it's money that just never went through somebody's meter or water that just went, didn't go through somebody's meter. So we have to kind of weigh the cost of, of reducing those leaks with the, the cost it would actually be to fix them. Now, if it's $10,000 a year and we want a two or three year payback, we can fix a lot of water mains and hydrants for that. The other thing, however, that we're exploring and that we're a little more concerned about is that we've got inaccurate or improperly recording meters. And that would mean real dollars. In other words, that water is being used, but it's not being properly metered. And so that is lost revenue, truly lost revenue. So the other part of our project in addition to this is to go through and first of all make sure that in uh, homes where we still have the inside meter and the outside reader I think it's it's kind of viewed as an old-fashioned thing right now but to make sure that those two meters are showing the same amount it's it's quite common apparently because there's actually PSC rules about it that the outside meter or what they call the R the ROM the ROM is not reflecting the exact usage that the inside meter is, is showing. And so this winter we're going to go through and, and make sure that those things do jibe up and make sure that the right size meter uh, is in some of our larger customers. Uh, we, we haven't found any real issues with that, but we also haven't been in everybody's door yet. So in other words, what I'm saying is that in addition to the leak detection, we're also going to be taking a close look at our meters and, and making sure that our loss isn't not a physical loss of water, but a paper loss of revenue. How often do you check uh, the outside meters? Is it every other month or every other three months? Well, no, that we check them. Yeah. No, it's like every ten years. They're they're. When you, you how oh, often you read them? The meter readers. Well, we read them every month. Every month. Right. Yeah. The outside ones, but we don't read the inside ones every month. I should bring my bill in because last month. It was two, and it went up to seven. Well, we appreciate the contribution. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't and that's think exactly my might be the thing we're looking for, that one of them is not reading the same as the other. Yeah. And that's I, why we want I, to get into it. I was kind of shocked, because it usually hovers around three to four to five, and uh, last month it was two. I thought, well, that's kind of low. I thought I didn't yeah. decrease my water usage. Then my, this bill was $350 range because... It went to a seven, which if, if, to fill if, up if it's so yeah, <laughs> if, if it's manually read, then it could have been a misread, and then it gets caught right. on the next. Yeah, one. yeah, I don't, yeah. I've, I've had that happen before. Yeah. Um, when yeah. I lived in Madison, they told me they would only re read it every two to three months, and they kind of guessed on yes. what it is. Yeah. So I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Well, are the, with the leaks, is it usually at the joints or with corrosion of the uh, piping or both? Or? It, well, it could be both. What the, uh, the gentleman that actually did the, the study for us said that typically the types of leaks that he locates on a main would be at joints. That if we actually have uh, a leak in the mid pipe or there's corrosion or a crack or something like that, it's difficult to actually detect the difference in sound between that and simply water rushing through the pipe. But apparently there's a, a, a different pitch noise when it's at a, at a joint. At least that was the education he gave us. Having never done this before, we weren't quite sure how the whole thing worked. But. Well, this might be a dumb question, but with that much water leaking, wouldn't these be muddy around those fire hydrants? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not necessarily. Mm. 
that's the you know that's the problem with water and underground facilities in general we found leaks that you know just kind of appeared one day and it's entirely possible based on the way the the ground was blown away around it that it could have been leaking a long long time we actually just had one at the intersection of uh, well by your house Vicki Oak and uh, Washington and Water Street Oak and Water Street and uh, we didn't find that one except it began the intersection began to sink you know the, the classic sinkhole mm -hmm. well when we got when we dug down there wasn't much around that pipe anymore and it was a very tiny leak so that could have been literally leaking for years and it just finally showed itself so the difficult thing about these leaks is that if 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 the if the hole is facing down we may never find it uh so it it's a real real tough situation and we're not alone i i, I wanted to make two other points one we're not alone um Boy, I, I think it's uh, the city of Milwaukee. Uh, they have literally thousands of leaks, and I think they made a commitment, if I remember right, to fix 700 leaks a year for the next 10 years or something like that. They're spending big dollars to do that. The infrastructure is getting old. That, that, that's all there is to it. And so I, I wanted to make you aware of, like I say, two other things. One is there could be some significant uh, dollars that will have to be spent in the next 10, 20 years to, to keep this infrastructure going. Now, we know that when we do Main Street in 2018 or so, that entire street will have to have its water and sewer system replaced. Uh, so, you know, they've gone a long time, but they've kind of lived their life now. We're going to see more and more of these systems failing. The other thing I wanted to just kind of prime you for, if I will, in regard to the meters, we are considering and, and we'll be talking to you more about an automated meter system, uh, one that is a little more sensitive. In other words, the meters will detect uh, down to a smaller usage and uh, is able to or will allow us to see what's happening with that meter literally on an hourly basis. So if something is leaking, uh, in a meter or if a meter is misreading we will know about it you know, almost immediately with the the new technology and these meters and so we're looking at doing that both on the water side and the electric side and just kind of stepping up uh, to the technology a little bit here but my, my hope is that in the next month or two we can make a presentation to you and, and you can see just what what's up with the technology and we can talk about where we want to go in Lake Mills. So you're going to be able to tell me when I take a shower? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not you specifically. Yeah. <laughs> you or your wife. <laughs> well, that'll be. I'll know, but I won't tell anybody. <laughs> no. If it's three quarters of an hour. No, you know, you raise, actually you raise a very important point, and I and what what's happening right now is there's a lot of uh, misinformation or some fear about these uh, high-tech meter systems that can do what you're saying you know they'll know everything you're doing inside of your house and all that we're not going to that the smart meter stuff we're, we're not going to that we're looking at simply a better way to read our meters so that we can we can be more accurate and timely with our meter reading and to get some data back so that we know if something has gone wrong uh, it's also a good tool for outages. We can we can have a map now. As they, everybody thinks we have a map that shows where the power is on and where it's off. Well, the day isn't too far away when we literally literally would have that kind of a map, but uh, not until we change our meter system. So, so if the power goes off, I don't have to call the sheriff department anymore. You would get dinged at the. My if uh, if we're really good at what we're doing, we'd call you the instant before it goes off. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so are, are you keeping the DNR well informed on this like you are with the wastewater? Yes, we are. Yeah. The DNR could darn near move in with us with all the times that we're in touch with them. But yeah, we have been in very close contact. This, is, this comes out of our uh, sanitary survey, which I think we talked about in the summer. And well, we're doing this because the DNR required us to do this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and they know we've done it, and they know the results, and absolutely we're keeping how, it. How much did this study cost, by the way? Thirty-nine hundred dollars. Okay. There isn't as the water leaks out of the system, and it let's uh, let's say it uh, starts percolating back into the ground. It, it's recycled. 
Well, yeah. that's my point is you know, it's not going to upset um, because it's drinking water, it's not going to upset, but then again, you get sewage in that stuff that's leaking, uh, the groundwater contamination. I mean, I'm running into that problem, are we? Not that I know of. I, I, uh, my, my only response to that would be is that this is really, when it leaks at three to four feet below the surface, it really does take a long time for it to get down to our wells, which are, yeah. you know, quite deep. Uh, as far as where the water is actually going, we don't know. We we believe in some cases we're, we've seen it, excuse me, going into uh, cracks in our storm sewer, like downtown here. We're relatively sure that we've got fresh water coming into the storm sewer system, but can't find where it's coming from, and it's just when these slow little trickles so it uh, you know actually where the water is going I, I we don't know i suspect in a hundred years we'll be uh, much more on top of this than we are now and that'll be good for those folks that are around then <laughs> paul i'm really surprised when you say when it says we're, we're losing 30 percent of our water but it only when you say it's only worth ten thousand dollars of revenue that, uh -huh. that, that seems, that's wholesale really it that, seems yeah, like it, a couple of order of magnitudes off well what what we're basing that cost on is the pumping cost again it's not necessarily lost revenue because it never made it to the meter if you will but the cost our, our annual cost to pump water is about fifty thousand dollars okay and so we're just, you know, we're figuring in the cost to pump water, uh, you know, the wear and tear on the pumps, et cetera, that we're losing maybe about ten thousand dollars. There's no other, no other costs of the water other than the pumping right out of the well. Chlorination. Chlorination. Yeah, we kind of figured that into there. The chlorination, yeah. fluoridation, that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It it is a little bit surprising, but think about that as it being every year. That's ten thousand yeah. dollars gone and so it's a big enough issue that we're going to go after it. but I can see where if we were to fix every single thing on the sheet here that'd have almost like decades break even be if yes you're, if you're just gonna exactly and that's my point and that's why we're gonna go after if you will the low-hanging fruit here and see what what that does if we don't have to dig up any mains we'll wait until they break or they, they show yeah but uh, yeah that's why we're gonna take it in the steps we're gonna take it okay it's nice that there's so many hydrants rather than digging up. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good thing, up, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, digging up mains uh, or services at Main Street and whatever that cross street yes. is. Yes, yes, yeah. This the spin guy said, "Hey, this is a really good thing that we found all these leaks." So. Yeah. <clears throat> if nothing else on that, we'll move on to item seven: rec recommendation for future agendas. Anybody have anything? If not, we'll move right on to item eight. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anything with uh, you, any of the other utilities coming up that we need to be aware of? I, uh, oh, the rate hike hearing that we had today. Yes. I think I can, I can talk about that, can I? I I'll, I'll, I'll answer before she does. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we had our uh, our rate hearing with the PSC today. Uh, there were no uh, no one from the public attended, and uh, there was one or excuse me two comments that came into the PSC electronically, and we were told by staff that we will get the results of of the, the analysis and audit and all that stuff by December first, or in, in order to enact any kind of adjustment by December first, if not done by January first. Okay. Other than that, everything is just, you know, other than the water and the wastewater and the electric, uh, everything is just as smooth as you can want it to be. <laughs> That's sarcasm, I should say that. So <laughs> that All right. If nothing else, then I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.